Good morning, Near North. Good morning. Good morning. We've got a clap. That's good. I'm excited to be here. So good to be with you this morning. My name, as Nia said, is uh, Phil Adams. I serve um, as Associate Global Pastor across Park and also serve in the north region of Park as one of the pastors up at Sabkasahara, the church on Devon. One of the uh, beautiful, exciting things about being a family of interdependent churches across the city is being able to come and share and share God's word um, with you here at Near North. So thank you, Pastor Nia and, and the elders for your kind invitation um, this morning. It's really exciting and grateful to be here with you. If you've been coming along over the last number of months or weeks, you'll know that uh, currently we're in a series at Park here. We work through books of the Bible from the beginning to the end, so we're currently in a series working through the book, the Old Testament book of Daniel. And to give you a little bit of the lay of the land of what's going to happen this week and next week as we enter into the final few chapters of the book of Daniel, the last three chapters of the book are one uh, unit. They form one unit together. So this week we're going to look at Daniel chapter 10, and then next week uh, you guys are going to look at chapter 11 and 12 and close out the book. So if you've got a Bible there with you, please turn to Daniel chapter 10. It'd be great to have it open. We're going to read through that whole chapter um, in a few moments. Daniel chapter 10. And this is, this is maybe the first message that you're jumping into in this series, the book of Daniel. It's basically a kind of memoir as such. It's a book written uh, by a man who lived about 500 years before Jesus Christ was born, and he's reflecting back on his life after a pretty extraordinary life, and the majority of his life he spent captive in a foreign land. And this is a pretty short book, the book of Daniel, but Daniel writes about a lot of different things, and particularly what he writes about or what stands out are four separate times in his life when he received a vision from God. Four times through supernatural means, God reveals something to Daniel. And in the final section, section of the book that we're going to look at this week and next week, starting in chapter 10, Daniel shares with us about the fourth and final vision that he has. And there's something that I want you to remember this morning because as we work through this passage, even though it's only a prelude or it's only an introduction to the final vision, today we're going to see one of the most unique passages in the Bible because it's one of the clearest examples in all of Scripture where the curtain is pulled back, so to say, and we get a glimpse of the unseen spiritual realm. We get a glimpse this morning of the fullest extent of the reality that we are a part of. And that's the tension that we're going to be drawing out in our passage today, the tension between the seen and the unseen. And because there are a lot of rabbit trails that our minds might go down this morning, I want us to remember that Daniel's visions, all of them, every time he gets a glimpse of what God is doing in the spiritual realm of the unseen, it is for the sake of something. The visions Daniel receives are a means to an end, and the end to which God gave these visions to Daniel was encouragement encouragement. That yes, Daniel and his people were going to encounter hardship and discouragement and persecution and rejection. And yes, there was going to be seasons of life under oppression and darkness. There was going to be war and there was going to be conflict. And yet each of Daniel's four visions take Daniel forward to see days yet to come, days that one day will come when an everlasting kingdom will be established with a rightful and righteous king enthroned who will one day reign with love and truth and justice and peace. Amen? And so the visions were given to Daniel for the sake of developing perseverance and hope in his heart through offering to Daniel an, an, an alternative perspective on his present circumstances, a perspective that is wider and deeper and fuller and more truthful. It includes not just his present and not just his past, but the very end to which Daniel's circumstances are leading him. And yet these visions weren't only for Daniel, rather God and his sovereignty knew that the visions given to Daniel would be written as a testament, not just for him and not just for his people, but for us, for you. So that amidst whatever you are waiting through right now, whatever you are enduring through right now, that you would know that faithful endurance in the life of a believer is always worth the wait. And so my prayer for you today is that you will leave not only with some kind of cognitive insights into the fullest extent of the reality that we are a part of, that there is a realm or a reality that exists beyond what we see, but also that you will leave with some heartfelt encouragement that no matter what you're walking through today, there is an unseen realm where God's grace is present and active and fighting for you. 
and the unseen realm is bringing about unseen days that are yet to come. So let's read Daniel chapter 10 together. Daniel chapter 10. And it reads like this. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel. He was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and his legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and I heard the sound of his, and I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoke this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips, then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me, and he said to me, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage." And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I come out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of the truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Let's, let's pray before we jump into this chapter. God, we come before you, God, we just um, thank you, God, that we gather here as your people. We thank you, God, for this place, this space, God, where we can come around your word, God, and we just come um, acknowledging our need of you. God, we acknowledge that there are many things that, to distract us and take our minds into different places and just different directions this morning, God, and we ask, God, that uh, you would enter, come into this room, God. God, would you uh, guide our hearts and our minds towards you? God, I pray, God, that you would open our hearts to the dependency that we have on you, God, that we would lean in, that we would seek you this morning, God, we would seek to be changed by your word and transformed, God, that we would live lives more and more faithful, God, to you, God, that we would be a people, God, who are Christ-like in this city and in this world, God. Do that in our hearts this morning, I pray, in your name, amen. Chapter 10. Verse 1 opens like most chapters in Daniel with a grounding in a specific uh, point in time. It opens in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which tells us that this passage speaks about a time just after the Jewish people had begun to return from exile in Babylon. And if you've been following along with us, you might remember in chapter 9, Daniel prays that his people who've been taken captive in Babylon would be able to return to Jerusalem, that they'd be able to return to their homeland. And now we enter into a period where God has given them and granted that request. My, my sister-in-law and her husband in London right now, they have a, a family from Ukraine that are living with them in their home. And what is this family's hope? What is their desire? Is it to, to, to stay? No, it is to return home back to their homeland. And now in our passage this morning, Daniel's people have begun to return under leaders like Ezra and Zerubbabel and Nehemiah back to Jerusalem. 
Then in the rest of verse 1, we get a summary of the next three chapters in which a word is revealed to Daniel through a vision. It says, and the word was true, and it was about a great conflict, and he understood the word, and he had an understanding of the vision. And then in verse 2, the summary ends, and we enter into the circumstances leading up to the vision in real time. Verse 2 says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. And we don't really know why Daniel is mourning. We don't know why he's grieving. Some scholars think it's because of the dire circumstances that Jewish people are actually, that are, they are actually returning to in their homeland. Maybe he is uh, thinking about the task of rebuilding the temple that's been destroyed. Some people think that maybe he's mourning because for some reason he himself in his old age isn't going to get to return. But what we can be pretty sure of is that his, reg- his grief relates to the uncertain future of his people. That although they are returning from exile, will there ever again be a restoration of the glory and the splendor of former days? Will there ever be a future that is hopeful again? And we see that Daniel expresses his mourning in a unique way. In verse 3 it says he ate no delicacies, he ate no meat, and drank no wine. And what Daniel is referring to here is the spiritual practice of self-denial. What is this? Daniel is saying no to certain things that he could have if he chose to have them as a means of expressing his sincerity before God. This is what the spiritual practice of self-denial is, or sometimes you'll hear us referring to fasting, demonstrating before God what we really care about by willingly giving up what we care less about. And the truth is that prayer that is intentional before God always entails some level of self-denial. Because yes, God hears us as we pray when we're driving our cars or we're running through our life from point A to point B, busy doing this and that, throwing out popcorn prayers as thoughts come to mind. And yes, we can pray at any moment in time when God hears us, but also intentionality around prayer, setting time aside, getting up early, going to bed late, having designated times of prayer, being intentional with prayer when we could be doing something else, praying when we could be enjoying something else, that intentionality in and of itself actually adds weight and sincerity to our prayers, which begs the question of us, when is the last time we truly set time aside to pray? When is the last time we truly set time aside to pray? Maybe a fresh intentionality around your prayer life is something God is going to call you to consider this morning. Daniel understood this, hence in verse 3 it tells us he engaged in this intentional effort of self-denial in prayer for three full weeks. And even though we don't know the specifics as to why Daniel is praying, it's clear this was a season for Daniel when the circumstances of life had brought him to his knees. You know, I would like to be able to tell you this morning that my prayer life is so consistent and so disciplined that when hardships and trials come along, I just need to keep praying as I'm already praying and and simply incorporate the hardships into the pre-existing rhythms of prayer that I have. That's probably something I should aspire to, but rather I have found myself praying with the most fervency and the most discipline and intentionality, not when I simply decide to be more disciplined in prayer, but when the circumstances of life necessitate deep in my heart that I can do nothing but pray. It's not hard to relate to Daniel today. Some of us this morning are likely in seasons just like Daniel. Maybe it's been for the past three weeks. Maybe it's been for the past three months. Maybe it's been for the past three years. There has been, or maybe there should have been, an inevitable intentionality around your prayer life, not because you necessarily want there to be, but because the circumstances of life have brought you to your knees. Maybe that's you this morning. And what we're about to see is that the vision Daniel receives is a response to Daniel's sincerity and intentionality in prayer. Verse 4 reads like this, On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing at the great river, that is the Tigris, this river still, you can go see it between Turkey and Iraq today, Daniel has been mourning in prayer for three weeks, and now he's standing on the shore. In verse 5, he writes, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man 
He was clothed in linen with a belt of gold. Daniel says his body was like beryl, which is a kind of crystal. His face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and his legs like gleaming bronze. And it says the sounds of his words were like the sounds of a multitude. That means if you imagine the roaring crowds at Soldier Field or Wrigley being condensed down and then shattering through the voice of one person. Verse 7 tells us those that were with Daniel couldn't see what he was seeing in it, yet there was still enough of an awareness of something extraordinary and terrifying that happened, that they knew was happening, so they turned and they ran. Then Daniel writes in verse 8, so I alone was left and saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. He writes, my radiant appearance was fully changed, which means his composure and his dignity as a ruler in the king's court vanished and Daniel faints, loses consciousness and slumps face down into the ground. By Daniel's response, we know something astonishing, something terrifying is happening. But what's worth noting here is that Daniel is not having a dream. In fact, in the very next verse, in verse 10, we clearly see he is awoken from his unconscious state and brought to his knees, trembling. Daniel is wide awake. Daniel sees what he sees as clearly as right now. I can see you and you can see me. And in our day-to-day lives, we don't really have much of a category for this, do we? I mean, we, we sing songs that infer a spiritual reality. We, we study a book. We base our lives around a book that unquestionably speaks about the supernatural and divine intervention. And yet, this? Did this really happen? Are there really angels? What are angels? Who are angels? A man appearing with eyes like lightning and a body like crystal, a voice like multitudes. It seems, or I find that there, there's a sense of spirituality that we are comfortable with. We believe in the supernatural up to a point, but anything too concrete or too wacky often begins to feel unbelievable or questionable. And there's a reason for this. During the, the 17th and the 18th centuries occurred what is commonly known as the Enlightenment which we still feel the effects of today and how we perceive the world that we inhabit. The, the Enlightenment was a, a period of profound scientific discovery. There were significant advances in medicine and physics and mathematics, Isaac Newton being a key figure of the, of the Enlightenment with his discovery of gravity. And one of the results of the age of reason is common, commonly known as disenchantment, which is the perception that we now live in a disenchanted world where we no longer feel the need to explain the unknown or the mysterious through means of religion or spiritual, or spiritual realm. And so what disenchantment has ultimately done is reduce the boundaries of credibility. Disenchantment has reduced the boundaries of where meaning or answers to the deepest questions of life are allowed to be credibly found. But what's fascinating is that this reduction and the removal of this spiritual realm has dismissed our very own intuitions and the intuitions of the vast majority of people who have ever lived and the vast majority of people who are alive today. And that intuition is that an explanation for our world, which truly incorporates the fullest extent of human experience, is only possible if there exists a world beyond ours. It's been said that the greatest achievement of a secular society is to suppress this intuition and live without answers to the deepest questions of life. Who are we? How did we get here? And why are we here? Marilyn Robinson, who was a professor in Iowa, puts it beautifully by saying, we are encouraged in a secular, disenchanted society to accept as hard truth a conception of reality that deprives us of means to talk about ourselves in clearly necessary terms meaning to believe in human dignity and human worth and human rights or human consciousness or human meaning necessitates the acknowledgement of a value placed upon humanity that can't be bestowed solely from within the physical world. We see this value in the eyes of our children. And yet what's interesting is that the same science that spurred on the enlightenment and the consequent disenchantment that we feel is likely will, what will bring about a re-enchantment. Albert, Albert Einstein himself said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science, scientific views end in awe and mystery, lost at the edge in uncertainty. 
which is all to say nobody should be made to feel foolish for believing in a reality that necessitates not only the acceptance of what we see, but also the acceptance of what we cannot see. The absurdity of a spiritual realm is simply counter-argued by the absurdity of our physical realm. Both seem just as unlikely and therefore just as likely. And so where we start is not needing renewed wonder and renewed dialogue in regards to who might angels be, but firstly renewed wonder and renewed dialogue regarding who we might be. Because if we are made in the image of God, angels are no more wonderful than that. Something that encourages me, given the lack of Daniel-esque visions in my own life, is that although the Bible undoubtedly refers to a world beyond the material, it also sets the normative expectation that we aren't going to see it. The Bible actually sets the expectation for us, at least right now, that we are not going to see visions like the one in our passage. And there are numerous verses that affirm this. Let me read some. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we live by faith, not by sight. 1 Corinthians 13 12 says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we will see face to face. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. John 20, 29, Jesus himself asked, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Seeing what Daniel looks up and sees, the Bible agrees, will not be a normative experience for us. Hence, the scripture doesn't challenge us as to what is normal, but it does challenge us as to consider what is possible. And an answer to our deepest longings and intuitions and experience whether what is possible might actually be credible. Let's jump back in. Verse 10. After Daniel trembles onto his knees, this angelic being tells Daniel to stand to his feet, which he does while still trembling. And this is what Daniel is told, one of the most interesting, mysterious passages in the Bible. Verse 12, it reads like this. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. And then we get this, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. And the first thing we notice in verse 12 is that Daniel's prayer was heard on the first day that he began to pray. Think about that. In relation to whatever you've been bringing before God in prayer. Whether you've been pleading with God for three weeks or three months or three years or three decades. Prayer, prayers of relief, prayers of freedom, prayers for your children, prayers for belief. You know, even if you can't remember the first day you prayed, God remembers. And he heard you on the first day. And then we read in the latter part of verse 12 that this angelic being didn't just randomly show up. Its arrival wasn't totally out of the blue. This angelic being was sent in response to Daniel's prayers. Church, our passage this morning reminds us, much like a lot of Daniel, that God works through the prayers of his people. He responds to our prayers. Think about that. God chooses to work through the prayers of his people. Our prayers participate in the bringing about of what will be. And there is mystery in this and there is wonder and that's okay, but God sovereignly plans that what will be will come into being as a result of the prayers of his people. Which means if we grasp this and if we are a praying people, Maybe we won't be able to line up the direct impact of our prayers from the vantage point that we are currently living, but one day, you know, God is going to be able to reflect on our lives and tell us. You know when you, why you were able to persevere through that trial? It's because you came to me in prayer and I give you strength. You know what sustained you from ruin when all of those temptations were hounding you? I was your strength because you hid yourself in me. You know when you lost that job but you still had that peace and that joy and that hope? You know why that was? Because you got on your knees that night and you told me you trusted me. 
You know, when you were lonely and that person came into your life, that friend, that partner, you know that was because when you prayed, I sent them. Church, a lifetime of prayer is a lifetime of participation with God in seeing his will enacted through ours. A lifetime of prayer is a lifetime of participation with God in seeing his will enacted through ours. Near North, there is nothing else in all of the universe that is comparable to the wonder of human consciousness. Our ability to think and think about thinking, to receive and interpret knowledge, to create and write songs and tell stories and dream beyond our existence. Hence, it would seem prayer. The ability to commune with our creator is a dignity befitting to the astonishing reality that we exist as we do, and maybe even the reason why we exist as we do. The remarkable dignity of prayers being welcomed as participants in shaping the future through the Alpha and the Omega, choosing to respond to our desires with grace and favor. And yes, there are times God will say no. There are times when his grace and his favor will be in his no. But we are only ever going to know how many times he's going to say yes if we pray. Church, live to find out. Pray to find out. God beckons us as our Heavenly Father to come to him and draw near to him with what we long for. Jesus said, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What's interesting in verse 12, is that what is inferred is that the angel was actually dispatched to go to Daniel as soon as Daniel began to pray. This all gets a little hard to wrap our heads around, but the answer to Daniel's prayers were dispatched. The answer was on its way for three weeks. <laughs> And then we ask, well, what took the angel so long? What took the the vision, what took the encouragement so long in coming to get to him? Verse 13 tells us, it says, the reason the angel was delayed was because an entity called the prince of the kingdom of Persia resisted and fought against the angel that was sent to Daniel for 21 days. And this entity is commonly understood to be a demon or an evil spirit. And the only reason that the angel was able to be released from the battle, it says, is because Michael, another angel, turned up to, t- turned up to fend off the evil spirit, allowing the first angel to be freed to go and deliver the vision of encouragement to Daniel. All in all, this passage has remarkable similarities to an Avengers movie. This might, in some sense, be some copyright issues that we're discovering this morning. This is like the original Avengers Assemble. We got the messenger angel dispatched to Daniel. We have the prince of the kingdom of Persia, who seems to be a demonic force, who has some territorial ownership over the region of Persia, which creates all kinds of questions. And then we have the angel Michael turn up to fight and release the first angel, and then goes and somehow appears before Daniel as he is out strolling by the river. And so... What are some things that we can learn from this? Here are three takeaways. Number one, firstly, we accept that there is a resistance. We accept that there is a resistant, resistance fighting against our joy and our hope and our encouragement occurring in an unseen realm that is either all around us or parallel to us which affects us. In our passage, there was a demonic effort to keep Daniel mourning, to keep him grieving, to keep him discouraged. Ephesians 6, 12 says it like this, for our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, which means that there is an aspect of your struggle what has brought you to your knees, whatever that is, that isn't only about what you see on face value or what you think it seems to be about, there is a deeper and hidden reality. In the life of the believer, for those that have given their lives to Christ, there exist spiritual forces of evil fighting against our joy, our hope, our peace, our happiness. It doesn't mean that we begin to see the demonic as directly behind every negative event in our lives, but it should heighten our awareness to take the supernatural forces fighting against us seriously. 
causing us to view the tools of our faith, tools like prayer, meditation on God's word, fasting, abiding in Christ, building one another up within the church, not as optional luxuries or spiritual pick-me-ups along the way, but weapons of war that are key to your survival. Takeaway number two. Persistent, intentional prayer is key to the arrival of our own encouragement. Persistent, intentional prayer is key to the arrival of our own encouragement. Something really interesting, something really interesting in this passage is that Daniel prayed for three weeks, which in verse 13 is the exact same length of time the angel took the angel to fight before Michael came up to let him go. So while Daniel prayed for three weeks, the angel fought for three weeks, which seems to communicate that in some profound way, the ongoing prayers of Daniel were a factor that determined the outcome as to whether the answer to Daniel's prayer would arrive or not. Daniel's initial prayer determined the angel's dispatch, but it was his ongoing prayers that determined the angel's arrival, meaning that persistent, intentional prayers of Daniel were key to the arrival of his own encouragement. Takeaway number three. Willa Carther, Cather says, there are some things you learn best in calm, and there are some things you learn best in storm. There are some things you learn best in calm, and there are some things you learn best in storm. For whatever reason, God in his sovereignty chooses to place his people, and now we know his angels, in battles, sometimes working together in the sea in battle. And although we don't know the reason why God allows there to be resistance against our encouragement, we can rest assured that there is a reason. Church, God has heard your prayers. He heard them on the first day you prayed. And if you're still waiting, you're waiting for a reason. And the reason for your waiting is God's grace to you. He's teaching you faith. He's teaching you commitment. He's teaching you patience. He's teaching you calm. He's teaching you to pray. Finally, let me close with this. Whether you've been pleading with God for three weeks, three years, three months, three decades, prayers of relief, prayers for your children, prayers for freedom, prayers of belief, there is in one, there is one in the unseen who's praying for you. Romans 8, 34 says, Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And what is inferred in Romans 8, 34 is not only that Jesus is bringing his children before the Father in prayer, but, that as, but as the resurrected Christ, he is praying from position of victory. Colossians chapter 2, 15 says, On the cross, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Hence, our story today of a battle in the unseen is just a foreshadow of a greater battle that occurred in the unseen. When beyond the nails and the wood and the crown of thorns on the cross, hidden from sight, a battle at the crucifixion was being waged. When the spiritual forces of darkness were seeking to crush hope and love incarnate, and yet, paradoxically, through Christ laying down his life, through his weakness and defeat, Christ brought about not their victory, but his. And so, as Christ intercedes for the saints, it means he is not only praying on our behalf, but that he is offering his victory to us as our own. So that whatever resistance we still face in this life, resistance that hinders our hope and our joy and our encouragement behind all that hinders us, a great happiness is hiding. The resurrected Christ, unseen and enthroned. As a reminder that there are unseen days yet to come. When the spiritual forces of evil will not only be defeated, but enchained and forever banished. Romans 8, 24 says, For in this hope we are saved. I hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And in the meantime, whether three weeks, three years, or three decades, whether we pray for the end of an illness, the arrival of a spouse, the salvation of our children, or the, or the return of Christ, we pray, knowing that persistent, intentional prayers 
or the intentional, intentional, consistent prayers of Daniel were the key to the arrival of his own encouragement. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you invite us to come to you. And that there is not a moment, there is not a second, that there, and there is not a word, God, that you do not hear. And there is not a word that you hear from us that you do not care about. God, we claim the cross this morning as your children. We come before you recognizing that if Christ died for us, there is nothing that you will not do for, there is nothing that you will not will hold that is good for your children. So God, we come to you now with all of our longings, with all of our heart's desires, asking you to move and intervene in our lives, to lead us and guide us, God. God, I pray if there is a spiritual warfare happening in this room, God, if people are are oppressed by the enemy and the enemy is seeking to steal joy and to steal hope, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you will banish that spirit. God, that you will give freedom and joy in the gospel, God, that there were an incredible abounding awareness of your love for your children. God, I pray, God, today that if people have come in here fearful, God, of what could happen in their lives, fearful, God, of of the enemy, God, I pray that they would find freedom in the gospel, that there is one stronger, that there is one greater, there is one that offers forgiveness of sins and eternal life. God, I pray, God, today, God, people would give their lives to you, knowing that in you is safety, is is security for all of eternity. In your name, amen.